Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, some vaccine clinics are struggling to fill thousands of slots. We have the vaccine, we have the staff in place uh, to do it, so all we need now is you. It's prompted some doctors to sound the alarm. So what's the solution? Charges are laid after a horrific stabbing attack at a North Vancouver library. The attacker ran into the library and started stabbing a woman, and she yelled to her daughter to run and hide. A Quebec man's fight with Honda over the heating system of this popular SUV. I really feel like I'm driving a three-season car. It was not made for Canadian winter. And he's not the only one complaining. An Ontario business teetering on the brink. It's going to be really hard for the bowl now they keep pulling back from lockdowns. The loyal customers who are helping them pull through. How much I enjoy it to get out of the house and have other people around me. This is The National. A day after a mass stabbing shook North Vancouver, claiming one life and marking so many more, police have now named their suspect and charged him with murder. But the big question, why, remains unanswered tonight. The chaos erupted here in the middle of a busy Saturday afternoon as people scramble to get away, but not everyone could. As Briar Stewart shows us, the violence has left this community reeling and mourning. Police tape still encircles the library and the rest of the crime scene, but all through the day, people came to lay flowers. But I just wanted to show my support, and I'm very sorry about it all. It was a much more somber scene in Lynn Valley today than the chaos that unfolded yesterday afternoon. I hear screaming, like out of control screaming. Ethan Panetta was working making smoothies when he saw the attacker pull out a large knife. The suspect just stabs the guy mercilessly. And then at that moment, I was in, I was in a call in 911. Inside the library, there was a book sale going on. Shalova Clausen was there with her young daughter. Her sister describes what happened. The attacker ran into the library and started stabbing a woman and she yelled to her daughter to run and hide. And she went up to this stabber and started beating him with her umbrella. And then that's when he turned around and slashed her and stabbed her. Clausen survived and was discharged from the hospital today, but one woman was killed and five others were injured throughout the rampage. Come your head! Come your head! Police have charged 28-year-old Yannick Bendaogo with second-degree murder, and they're investigating what led up to the attack. Uh, he's had police interactions in the past. He does have a criminal record. A witness told CBC that Bendaogo had been hanging around the library frequently, carrying bags full of belongings. Police don't know what the motive was, but everyone has been struck by the apparent randomness of the attack. It's just very uh, close to home. It's too close to home. And uh, it was just, it's tragic. Briar Stewart, CBC News, North Vancouver. And just about 12 hours after that attack, there was another mass stabbing in BC, this time at an outdoor gathering near Kelowna. Five victims were taken to hospital. Police won't say how serious the injuries are. One man has been arrested. And the first-degree murder investigation involving a small-town Ontario doctor continues this weekend. OPP spokesperson Bill Dixon said that Dr. Brian Nadler is being probed over multiple suspicious deaths, but no word on additional charges. That's a moving target. We're starting off with, uh, you know, some recent deaths that were at the hospital. Where it goes from there, I can't speculate. Uh, Dixon also declined to offer any names of possible victims for the sake of their family's privacy. Meanwhile, people in Hawkesbury are sharing their shock and disbelief. I had that doctor treat me and he was fine with me. I was actually there for an appointment the day before. So it's a little bit unnerving. Still, most of those who spoke to CBC said they remain confident in the hospital. They'll continue to use it. This, though, just the latest challenge for Hawkesbury and District Hospital, which is also dealing with two COVID-19 outbreaks. Halifax police have launched an internal investigation over a video on social media. The audio is hard to discern, but it shows an officer pointing his weapon at a black man, threatening to, quote, fill him with lead. A police statement has since called the officer's language unacceptable. I will kill you. I will kill you. I will kill you. 
The man can be heard responding, you're not allowed to shoot me in the back. Shortly after, he ran away. The officer didn't chase him or shoot. Halifax police say three other men not seen in the video were arrested and the drugs and a loaded gun were seized. With every dose of vaccine given, Canada gets a little closer to ending the pandemic. And tonight, another hopeful milestone. The total doses given to people across the country has surpassed 5 million. Some of those are second shots, but more than 11% of people in Canada have received at least one. Canada now administering more than a million vaccinations a week. But there is a wrinkle. For now, the pace of new doses coming into the country is expected to be closer to 2 million a week. So provinces need to move twice as fast to avoid a glut and potentially waste. That means not just having vaccine sites up and running, but also getting people to show up for shots. In Quebec, officials are urging residents to book unfilled appointments. And in Toronto, Tally Ricci is tracking a scramble to keep doses from going to waste. Toronto's mayor wants to see vaccination sites like this full to the brim. Those 70 and over can now book their first doses, but he says not enough are. Please get vaccinated. And don't put it off, he said. Thousands of appointments are available this week. We have the vaccines. We have the staff in place uh, to do it, and we have the appointments. So all we need now is you. Peel Region says starting today, they'll have same-day appointments available for eligible residents there. On Friday, Michael Guerin Hospital released a standby form to bring people in for a shot on short notice. 60,000 people signed up in around 30 hours, and they're not taking any more. Eligible groups will be prioritized. At this Markham Hospital, physicians are growing frustrated with leftover doses. Many times we find ourselves a few hundred patients short. Dr. Weisberger says doctors at his hospital are rushing to match people with shots. The fact that 15 doctors are spending three hours on a Saturday and a Sunday to fill these clinics says there's something wrong with the way the system is working. I think that there should be a priority list, but at the end of the day, if there are vaccines that are drawn up and ready to go into arms, they can't be wasted. Dr. Isaac Bogosh, a member of Ontario's COVID-19 vaccine distribution task force agrees, but he says this isn't a problem everywhere. Obviously we have to look at why some individual centers don't have as many people going out to them. And I think this is, these are clearly growing pains that need to be ironed out as the program opens up and expands. Healthcare workers who are seeing the leftovers say a solution is urgently needed. Every day that a vaccine sits in a fridge, is a day for this pandemic to uh, rage and grow exponentially. Vaccine supply is expected to be steady and even increase through the spring and summer. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Public health experts have been warning that vaccinations won't come fast enough to prevent a third wave. And today, fresh evidence the rate of infections is surging. We seem to put the second wave behind us in mid-February, but the number of cases soon began accelerating. The average rate of daily new infections jumping by more than a third in the last two weeks. The rise is being seen across Western and Central Canada. And in Ontario, even more worrying for doctors is the number of COVID patients in ICUs. It surged 20% in the past week. At the same time, many people are struggling with social isolation. Let's bring in infectious disease specialist, Dr. Suman Chakrabarty. And Dr. Chakrabarty, there's so many people who are both concerned about the, the spread of COVID, but at the same time feeling like they need social contact. And, and you've pointed out that, that outdoor gatherings in the right conditions can be safe. Absolutely. Let's look at this from a harm reduction lens. We know a lot more about this virus than we did a year ago. We know that the risk of transmission is substantially reduced outside, if not negligible. No one's saying to get together in big concerts, but I think going outside, meeting with people, if you can't maintain distance for a prolonged time, wear a mask. Otherwise, I think it's a very safe alternative. And that's what we need right now, especially one year into the pandemic. And I think that being outside is a really, really good concession and a good harm reduction strategy. But I guess we shouldn't hide behind technicalities. I saw, maybe in response to a tweet of yours earlier, some people showing patios that kind of were outdoors but still were enclosed. By outdoors, you really mean outdoors, I guess. 
It doesn't mean, yeah, I agree. You, you want to go by the spirit of what that means. I think a roof is okay for a, like an awning for a patio, but you want to have the walls open to make this an actual outdoor, you know, fully ventilated area. Something that's fully enclosed is not truly outdoors. And if you're in the park and you're, you know, six feet away from somebody, can you do that without a mask? I think so. I think that we have to remember that when you're outside, it's essentially perfect ventilation. And looking at that, the risk is substantially reduced. It's not zero, but we need something for a harm reduction strategy. And the risk of transmission here is negligible. Always nice to get the guidance of infectious disease doctors. And so with that in mind, we've seen stories today. Talia earlier in the show, for example, talking about clinics having trouble getting enough people in to get their shots. Should Ontario and Quebec be expanding its criteria for vaccine eligible people? I think that would be a good idea, especially you want to get the people that need it the most, so we're going by age. But another big thing that we could try is going in the geographic hotspots, especially in essential jobs like factories, food processing plants, where we have a lot of transmission that is being driven by these areas. So I think it's a good idea. We can get more vaccines into people's arms and really change the trajectory of this pandemic. Dr. Chakrabarty, always nice having you on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Canadian border officials say they have caught 30 people trying to enter the country with fake COVID test results ever since having real ones became mandatory. Ten of those fakes were intercepted at airports between January 7th and March 24th, the other 20 at border crossings since the middle of February. Penalties can, can include up to six months in jail and a fine of up to $750,000 or more if contravening the Quarantine Act puts someone's life in danger. Members of Toronto's Asian community and their supporters held a rally at City Hall today calling for an end to anti-Asian racism. We will not be silenced, we will not disappear, and we will not be isolated. The Toronto gathering was part of a cross-Canada day of action with other events taking place in Calgary and Vancouver. Organizers said racism and violent attacks against people of Asian descent during the pandemic must stop. The United Nations wants to investigate accusations of genocide against China's Uyghur Muslims. As Ashley Burke tells us, the UN is talking with Beijing to get access to the Xinjiang region. We have always reaffirmed the, the absolute need of human rights to be respected. The UN Secretary General says serious negotiations are underway. The ask for a UN Human Rights Commissioner to visit China's Xinjiang province free of any restrictions. This is being negotiated at the present moment between the office of the High Commissioner and the Chinese authorities, and I hope that they will reach an agreement soon. And that human rights Antonio Guterres spoke in an exclusive interview with Rosemary Barton Live. Pressures mounting on the UN to investigate allegations of human rights abuses, even claims of genocide on the Muslim minority. China has uh, affirmed that uh, and reaffirmed to me in uh, several occasions that they want that uh, mission to take place. Stop the Uyghur genocide! Protests took place last month on Parliament Hill after media reports citing forced labor, sexual violence, and population control methods against the Uyghur population. My father was taken to the concentration camp, and after that, I didn't know what's happening, like what happened to them. This is text textbook-style genocide. Yesterday, China imposed sanctions on a list of individuals in Canada and the U.S., including Conservative MP Michael Chong and a House of Commons subcommittee on international human rights. Mr. Speaker. A move in retaliation after Canada and its allies place sanctions on four Chinese officials. The more the international world stands up in unison and starts highlighting things like the genocide in Xinjiang, that will show that the international community does not accept the conduct of the Communist Party of China. As we engage China, one of our biggest sources of strength, our alliances, our partnerships. When we approach the challenges that China poses together, we're going to be much more effective in dealing with them. Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Garneau said the world is watching China and Canada, along with its allies, will continue to take action when human rights obligations are violated. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. In Myanmar, it's been a weekend of violence. More than 100 protesters were killed yesterday. That bloodshed continued today, even as some of those victims were laid to rest. Helen Morrow shows us more, and some of what you'll see may be disturbing. A mother inconsolable, crying out, how can I live without you, to the body of her 13-year-old son. Tsai Wai Yan and more than 100 others killed by Myanmar's military. 
Security forces fired live ammunition at pro-democracy demonstrations across the country yesterday. Protesters rushing the injured away from the front lines, trying desperately to save their lives, vowing to press on despite the bloodshed. The carnage, the deadliest day since the military ousted the democratically elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. It happened as coup leader General Min Ong Lang marked the annual Armed Forces Day, holding a massive military parade in the capital city. Even as his forces were killing dozens of civilians, the general blamed the protesters, accusing them of violent acts. Today, President Biden condemned the regime. It's absolutely outrageous. And based on the reporting I've gotten, an awful lot of people have been killed totally unnecessarily. More than 450 people have died since the military took over early last month. The deadly upheaval forcing thousands more to flee to neighboring countries. Plunging so many others, like 13-year-old Sai Wai Yan's family, into immeasurable grief. Defense chiefs from 12 countries, including Canada and the U.S., issued a joint statement today denouncing the military's violence. But the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Myanmar is calling for stronger action, saying the international community is falling short and that without a tougher response, the crisis in Myanmar will likely get much worse. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. And we have a new development on this Pacific edition of The National. The Ever Given, the ship that's been blocking the Suez Canal, has been refloated. The massive container ship was freed in the early hours on Monday local time, six days after it became stuck on one of the busiest trade routes between Asia and Europe. That caused a traffic jam for hundreds of other vessels. More than $10 billion of goods passes through the Suez Canal on an average day. Since the death of George Floyd, eight months of racial tension have led to this turning point in Minneapolis. Give a big shout, give a big round of applause. Opening arguments begin Monday in the murder trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin, who pressed his knee on Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes. Stephen D'Souza is in Minneapolis tonight to look at that city's tug of war over what policing should look like. They tried burning down that mall over here yeah. multiple times. During the height of last summer's protests, some residents in North Minneapolis didn't call police. They called a group of armed volunteers. A lot of us are from the community, and, and so we had the slogan, from the community, by the community. The Minnesota Freedom Fighters patrolled neighborhoods and provided security for rallies and memorials. But in a city searching for new ways of policing, they say they're not the answer. We are not replacing the police. <laughs> we are not the police. Don't shoot! Last year, amidst nationwide protests after George Floyd's death, it seemed Minneapolis politicians were poised to take unprecedented steps. Our commitment is to end our city's toxic relationship with the Minneapolis Police Department, to end policing as we know it. Ten months later, there have been minor changes, but activists say they fall well short of what was promised. We have not changed. We've actually stepped back a little bit. She says police culture in Minnesota has barely evolved since Philando Castile was shot by an officer on this spot five years ago. This is police brutality. Just last week, she points out, a white officer appears to have punched a black teen during a confrontation. You know, when you clean a room, sometimes it gets messier before it gets before it gets cleaner, and I think that's what's happening with the police officers. Meanwhile, city councillors who once echoed protesters' calls now say their pledge was misinterpreted. We did not commit, we did not pledge to defund the police. City council member Philippe Cunningham is instead proposing a new public safety department, merging police with other city services. And what we fundamentally need is a new system of public safety that doesn't 100% rely on an armed police officer Further complicating the debate here, a rise in violent crime that has some who want reform in the odd position of advocating for more police. To defund the police is reckless and it's dangerous. Looming over all of this, the trial of Derek Chauvin. Even if he gets convicted, goes to jail, that's still not justice because the system hasn't changed. While expectations for the trial are low, Van Knight is optimistic that no matter the result, 
George Floyd's spirit will continue to drive the movement forward. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Minneapolis. As Chauvin's trial gets underway, a prominent African-American journalist says he's concerned about the verdict, no matter the result. I worry there's going to be major unrest on the streets. CNN's Don Lemon talks about racial tension in America and the polarized media landscape. Plus, it's been a tough winter for some Honda drivers struggling to get the heat on. It was not made for keen winter. The dangerous issue with some popular models. And a truck frozen in a river gets hauled out. It was very risky. The mission of removing more than 10,000 kilos of metal and ice. Stay with us. Welcome back. Newfoundland and Labrador's general election finally wrapped up this weekend. In the end, it was a narrow victory for the Liberals and a resounding loss for public confidence in the province's electoral system during COVID-19. Chaos, delays, missing ballots, it all led to the lowest voter turnout in provincial history. Here's Chris O'Neill Yates with the challenges of a pandemic election. The election outcome is not on Kim Barker's mind as she feeds these ducks today. Like 52% of voters, Barker did not take part in the mail-in ballot only contest. I actually uh, didn't really have much interest in it. Um, and I didn't vote because of the way the, the process was. Let me tell you wholeheartedly, I am ready to go. Andrew Fury's Liberals eked out a majority by just one seat in an election rife with problems. As cases of a COVID-19 variant mounted, the chief medical officer and the chief electoral officer argued over who had the power to postpone the election. Ultimately, it was polling booth workers that made the decision for them by refusing to work, resulting in the chief electoral officer announcing a vote-by-mail plan. Few liked it, and questions of voter suppression persisted to the end. Indigenous languages, accessibility for people with disabilities, seniors and immune compromised. Courtney Clark is a community advocate. So there's a lot of lessons to be taken from this. There are already speculations about court challenges waiting on the steps of the Supreme Court. NDP leader Alison Coffin, who lost her seat by 53 votes, didn't say if she plans a legal challenge. But this constitutional expert says challenges are likely. If it were a, a landslide victory, then people might say, well, why bother? This is already done. The will of the people is obvious. But where it's relatively close, it seems to me almost certainly we have not seen the last of some further legalistic discussion about this election. This election is proof of the old adage. If things can go wrong, they often do go wrong. And a lesson worth heeding for any government thinking of calling a pandemic election. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Today, the federal government took its first public step in atoning for injustices towards black Canadians during the First World War. They weren't allowed to fight, but the army used their labor here and overseas to help achieve victory. Vernon Ramasar looks at the makings of an apology. Today is a very special day. People in the black community have waited decades for this moment, especially descendants of the so-called Black Battalion from the First World War. Our country is still struggling with the insidious effects of racism. More than 100 years later, we can combat it by recognizing the failures of our past. This was Canada's first and only militia unit made up largely of black personnel. It was formed during a time when black soldiers were often barred from enlisting in the military. They were segregated during the war and further ostracized and discriminated against when they returned. No apology yet, so the black Battalion. but Douglas Ruck says today was a crucial step in the right direction. It's important to all African Canadians to hear it. It's important for the white population to hear it because of what it means and because of what it should mean towards the future. From the formation of the battalion... In Craig Smith, whose great-grandfather was in the battalion, says he is looking forward to discussions on a meaningful apology and would like to see something tangible offered, like a scholarship to the military or something that perpetuates their memory. We have a clean slate. We have an opportunity. Um, and now let's just sit down and brainstorm as to what that can look like. And that's why, that's why it's so special that it's the intent of an apology, because now we can look at putting together how will that look. He says he wants to see something that's a lasting tribute to the men who served under the shadow of prejudice. Vernon Ramisar, CBC News, Cherrybrook, Nova Scotia. 
American cable news has dramatically changed since the Donald Trump presidency. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to cut speak. you off. Can we please cut him off? Can we take him off the screen? My conversation with CNN anchor Don Lemon on dealing with tense encounters. What I don't want to do is elevate and, um, and, and promote liars. And living in the racial divide in America. Stay with us. With Derek Chauvin set to go on trial tomorrow, the debate over racial justice in America is playing out in homes, on streets, and in the media. I spoke to Don Lemon, a CNN host who's just released a book about his experiences and his perspective. You may already know him as a broadcaster eager to take sides. Let me not mince words here. This president traffics in racism and is fueled by bullying. From keeping children at the border in cages to bullying journalists at every one of his rallies and every chance he gets. That's how black people feel. The person who said from Klansmen and racists and Nazis and anti-Semites that there were very fine people on both sides. No one wants to hear that. Lemon's book, This is the Fire, recounts his country's long history of violence towards African Americans, from slavery to George Floyd. Don Lemon, real pleasure to, to speak with you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on CBC. We have heard so much about how the, the killing of George Floyd has had, had an impact, obviously on many people, but t particularly Americans and particularly African Americans. What impact has it had on you? Well, I, it was a there but for the grace of God go I moment. I start the book off by writing to my great nephew because I, I could see him in that moment and I would never want someone to treat him that way so I started the book by writing a letter to him. It was a profound moment. It could be any one of us on that page. That prologue is obviously an ode to James Baldwin so in your book you're writing as you say to your nephew inspired by the death or motivated by the death of George Floyd. James Baldwin wrote a letter to his nephew 60 years ago on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. When you look at those two events 60 years apart, these two books and, and what motivated them, does that inspire you or does that frustrate you, the sameness of it? Um, I, I will tell you, well, it's a combination of both, and I'll tell you why. Um, well, first of all, I'm glad you did your homework and your research because a lot of people don't um, know about the book, which was inspired by, uh, by James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. That's why I called the book This is the Fire. So it's frustrating in that we are still seeing having these moments of racial reckoning. But I am optimistic that because this particular event with George Floyd happened, and because of the empathy that so many people had and continue to have um, that was sparked from that moment, that we're going to move in a path that we are, not that we're going to cure this problem or fix this problem, but we can certainly make it better. And at least we can start the work uh, towards doing something in a significant way about the race problem in America and, and across the world. Your book is not only about very current events, but also steeped in history. And you describe some, some nauseating acts of violence against African Americans in the, in the late 1800s, the early 1920s. And you know, before I read your book, I might have thought of those as being almost ancient history. But I want to read a, an excerpt from your book where you say, who could perpetrate such a spiritually diseased act and then go on to shape a psychologically healthy society? Who could endure that level of trauma and go on with their life undamaged? Who witnesses atrocity of that caliber and walks away unchanged? I'll tell you who, no one, no ever. One. It sticks. No. Your premise is that those acts of violence on both the part of the perpetrator and the victim still has an impact today. Yeah, it does. I was talking about the German Coast um, uprising in Louisiana, uh, and this th this is um, when um, there were slaves who tried to free themselves and uh, tried to um, get away from slavery, and there was a lot of bloodshed, and a lot of lives were lost, and they ended up hanging um, the person who had inspired this uprising, hanging his head on a pike for the entire world to see. and. Mm. 
many, many people lost their lives um, because of it. So I, th I did that because we need to start at the beginning and we need to start with the real history of the country. And then you don't end up with people who are acting on lies and therefore who become, who think that the country is really built in their image. And you don't end up with an insurrection on Capitol Hill because then people are acting from the truth and not on a history of lies. You know, part of the state of America is the state of politics. It's the state of media and Canadian news networks are a lot different than than CNN and Fox and MSNBC. And, and I want to play a, an excerpt here uh, of a moment where you you cut off a, a panelist on an interview, John Fredericks. Well, Don, it's not about race, as you like to make it, because that's easy and lazy. It's about economics. My comment back to Maria is your children are going to have a much better economic future and a better chance for a, a good job than they would have had him under time. another president. Now, let me, let me, you called on me, so let me finish. Truer words, minus you know what, the You know what, John Frederick? Have you, know what, you know what, John Frederick? John, until that last you comment, you know, yeah, I'm going to cut speak? you off. Can we please cut him off? Can we take him off the screen? Can we take him, can we get rid of John Fredericks? Thank you. First of all, I was going to let him speak until you doubly insulted me. I don't even need to respond to the lazy comment. I laid it all out in the thing. We can have this conversation and we don't need someone who's going to make excuses for racism. I don't know that that moment, Don, would happen on, on Canadian television. And, and I think it speaks a little bit to just, it's a, f a little bit fiercer in, in the political and, and media kind of world in the United States. So how do you bridge the divide? You mean the divide between um, truth and lies, or are you talking <laughs> about the divide between right and left? Because there is a difference. Um, and listen, I'm glad that we have the freedom in this country to be able to have a, a tough conversation and an argument like that. But what I don't want to do is elevate and, um, and, and promote liars and lies and misinformation. It is not my job to promote misinformation. It is not that person's right to come on CNN and to promote misinformation. That has nothing to do with freedom of speech. So in that moment, what I was doing was protecting my audience from misinformation and, and trying to have that person understand, number one, they were being rude, and number two, that it was not their right to come on to a major news network and um, knowingly promote lies. Back in 1992, you and I both remember what happened in Los Angeles when the four officers who beat Rodney King were acquitted. And so let's go back to this Derek Chauvin trial now that we're on the eve of. Do you worry about what will happen in America yes. during and after this trial? Yes, yes, I do. I worry that if it is an outcome that does not deliver justice the way the family of George Floyd wants, uh, the way that activists want in this country, then I worry there's going to be a, there's going to be major unrest on the streets uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that we have not seen before, where the summer of 2020 pales in comparison. Okay, I hope that that does not happen. Now, if, if, he, if there is justice delivered, I also worry about the other side, about the division getting deeper and bigger, um, because that's just the world that we live in now. So regardless of what the verdict is, I'm cautiously sort of waiting to see what happens. And I am hopeful that it will be positive, but I'm not so sure. Um, but it's, it's a frightening prospect because we just don't know what's going to happen. We just don't know. Well, I hope people read your book. It is thoughtful and it's informative. I'd be quite happy if people in Canada didn't watch you on TV. That wouldn't bother me at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's, I wish, I can't wait uh, when we're off of this limited house arrest or whatever we're on right now so that I can actually get back to Canada uh, and visit some of my friends and some of the, my colleagues in the media there. It would be, it's gonna be wonderful. You know, we talked in that interview about a violent moment in history. It was the early 1800s. He described it, uh, the, the German coast uprising, really hard to read in the book. But Lemon says it's, it's important to put it in there. And he said even for him, going to an all-black high school, he never learned anything about it. And those lessons are important. Well, customers are speaking up about issues with their Honda that's left them cold. Winter passes and the car is not better. A faulty heating system, and they say the company isn't doing enough to fix it. Plus. It's been a challenge and a stressful challenge. Closed for a year. A family's afraid their dream business is headed for the gutter. That's next on The National.
Some Honda owners say they're stuck with vehicles not made for Canadian winters after discovering the heating system didn't work properly when the temperature dips below minus 10. Here's Go Public's Rosa Marcatelli. When we spoke with Jean-Francois Bollier a few weeks ago, spring couldn't come fast enough after spending the freezing Quebec winter driving his young family around in a vehicle that often won't heat up when it's cold outside. I really feel like I'm driving a three-season car. Basically, that's what it is, that it was not made for Canadian winter. He's not alone. A lot of customers are complaining about heating problems with certain popular Honda CRV and Honda Civics with a 1.5-liter turbo engine. This driver calls the heating issue a safety hazard, saying her windshield often won't defrost or defog and she can't see through it. When she complained, the dealership suggested she try not to stop and start while driving if she wanted heat. Honda tried to fix the problem in 2018 with a product update campaign. Bollier says in his case it didn't work and the car maker didn't seem interested in doing much more. And basically, after the recall, winter passes and the car is not better. After hearing from Go Public, Honda contacted Bollier, offering to reimburse him for out-of-pocket expenses, install an aftermarket heater, and try that 2018 software update again, the one that didn't work the first time. An automotive consumer advocate says car makers are allowed to get away with not fixing problems like this because some of Transport Canada's safety standards are decades out of date. The one for windshield defrosting and defogging, for example, was set back in 1964. There are some old standards out there that uh, unfortunately don't provide the minimum level of, of safety or protection we want today. For its part, Honda says it has addressed the problem through the 2018 update that includes what it calls countermeasures like software updates and replacement of the climate control unit for some drivers at no cost. After his experience, Bollier is skeptical the latest fixes will work, but he'll have to wait until the temperature drops again to find out. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Go Public. Our Go Public stories start with you, so if you have a tip that you'd like the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. We often talk about the impact of the pandemic on people and businesses as if they're separate issues, the personal and the economic. But for a group of bowlers in Orillia, Ontario, there is no separating the two. The last remaining bowling alley in the town is reopened, but it's struggling. And Nick Purden shows us the people relying on its survival. This bowling alley to me is, it's my life. When we bought it, we took everything, our heart and soul, all our money, we sold our, our beautiful house to buy this place. I mean, I love it here. This is like my home. It's a critical time at Andy and Kathy Rainey's bowling alley. Even though they've been allowed to reopen, they're not sure they're going to make it. Financially, our year has been a struggle. The bowling alley has spent most of its time closed, and it's today marks a year. Um, it's been really tough. That's true for many businesses because of COVID. The question I have is, what's it like to finally reopen? Ladies, how are you? Margaret. It's been great because we see the people that we haven't seen that we've seen daily before. Perfect, thank you. It's nice to see the happy, smiling people coming in to have fun. Nobody's had a harder time in the past year than our seniors, but today, Wednesday afternoon bowling is back. How much I enjoy it. I really, really enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it to get out of the house and have other people around me. Margaret Hubin is 94. She's been bowling here for more than 15 years. I look at the ball and I say, no, you're going to do good for me. <laughs> but I get what I get and what I don't get, okay, fine. I have lots of nice company around. Right now, because of COVID, only 10 people at a time are allowed inside to bowl. But if the pandemic worsens, the place could get shut down again. Have fun bowling. Yeah. And it's when I meet the people here, 
I understand the stakes. The local mental health support group was one of the first to book time once the bowling alley reopened. My two best games are 199 and 203, but that was many moons ago. Today, Dave Clark is just happy to be back. During the time that there was no bowling, I, I missed it. I'm relieved that it's back. Karen Lowen tells me COVID has been tough for anyone with a mental health issue. It's been a terrible year. It felt great to be bowling again. It just stimulates your mind, just going out there bowling. Wonderful. I scored 175 points. It was great to be come back. But for Doris Graham, bowling isn't just a sport. I was depressed in the house, and this is like a lifeline for me. Bowling is give me a kick when I have the ball in my hand to score the full points. This is the first time I'm laughing after one year, probably. Yeah, it's true. Doris will keep bowling here with her friends as long as the doors stay open. Uh, three on each lane for now, yeah, just three. But that might not be enough to save the business. Kathy says they're about $200,000 in the hole because of the pandemic. It's terrible. I don't like to see those numbers. They scare me. What are you going to do? It's a big loss. If we go into another lockdown for more than a couple weeks, even a couple weeks, is going to be really hard for the bull and alley to keep pulling back from lockdowns. Even so, Kathy and Andy believe their bowling alley will survive. And their most loyal customer, Margaret, says that's the attitude you need in these tough times. Be happy that the next morning you open your eyes and you feel you can go. You're still there, you're still around. Margaret knows what she's talking about. COVID isn't the first crisis that she's been through. I had hard times in my life very hard times. When I went through a war time in Germany, that is the reason we came to Canada. And that's we left everything what we had behind, everything. Escaping Nazi Germany taught Margaret that better days can come. And so she dreams of a world without COVID. The first thing I want to do is go on my knees and say, hallelujah, we are still alive. We are. I'm happy, my family is still alive, and I'm still alive, hopefully. But I like to see here the bowling alley filled from one end to the other one, everybody being happy in bowling. If anyone wants Margaret's vision to come true, it's Andy and Kathy. But these are uncertain times. We refuse to die. We're going to get out of this. We're going to do what we need to do. But it's been a challenge and a stressful challenge. When we think about the end of the pandemic, we imagine that one day it'll just be over. But the reality is probably more like what Kathy and Andy and most businesses are going through. Open, shut, stop, start. Stressful indeed. Nick Purden, CBC News, Aurelia, Ontario. A race against time and weather. A truck frozen in the ice. A small crew using a chainsaw to get it out. Our moment is next. The town of Fort Chippewin, Alberta had a problem. A truck fell through the ice in January and if it wasn't moved, it would eventually sink and end up as toxic junk in the river. But how do you remove a two-ton truck almost completely encased in solid ice? Well, it takes three people with chainsaws, know-how, and ice-cold nerves. And it sounds like a moment. The biggest challenge of the job was uh, safety. That's Ray Rossington, president of Big Ice Services. The issue was that cutting the ice might put the crew in danger. The vehicle going to the bottom of the... Uh of a very nice river forever, it's totally unacceptable. They used a machine to thicken the ice around the truck and make it safer. Even at that, we were adding ice on the top and it was wearing off on the bottom, which causes some concern. 
The truck itself wasn't the main problem. The ice encrusting it weighed five times as much. But with a custom-built rig, they were able to hoist it out. It was very risky. We took a lot of precautions. The men did well. They made it look, uh, look very easy. So they were wearing safety harnesses. Took about five hours, a little less than five hours, to actually do the cutting, but a month to let that ice build up. And so just some fantastic northern Alberta ingenuity. Maybe next stop, Suez Canal. That is the National for March 28th. Good night.